Thank you, everyone. I turn my mic on. Thank you. Uh, this is our city council meeting for Monday, December 14th, 2020 for the Lincoln City Council. Uh, due to the Christmas and New Year's Eve holidays, the city council will not meet uh, on Monday, December 28th or Monday, January 4th. In accordance with LB 898, please be advised that a copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in the back of the chamber by the Northwest door. Let us all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a brief period of silent meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The order of business of the City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on that item should come forward at that time and the clerk reads that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, then those opposed. The applicant may make then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating their name, address, and whether you're speaking in favor or in opposition to the item. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all the public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under third reading. On the second and last Mondays of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on any issue that's not on the agenda for that date, nor plan for any future agenda. Will the clerk please call the first item of business? A quick announcement before we start our agenda. Public comment, which is held after the last item on the agenda, is being offered in person in the council chambers or via webinar for the city council meetings being held on December 14 and December 21, 2020. For those who wish to testify by webinar, you must register with the city clerk's office to participate. Please contact the city clerk's office at 402-441-7436 or by email at cityclerk at lincoln.ne.gov. The city clerk's office must be notified by 12 p.m. the day of the meeting. In order to register, please provide your name, address, email address, and contact number. If you have concerns you wish to express to the city council, please email them to councilpacket at lincoln.ne.gov. If you still wish to appear in person on an item on the agenda, you may come to the county city building at 555 South 10th Street. You'll be asked to wait in the Bill Luxford studio or in the hallway until your item is called. Then you can enter the council chambers and come to the podium. After you are finished speaking, you can exit the chambers to the door to your immediate left. You may view the meetings at YouTube, HTTPS, YouTube.com, or LinkTVCity, or Facebook.com at LNKTVCity. Our first item on the agenda is our consent agenda, sections one and two. Is there anyone wishing to address an item that's on our consent agenda? could come forward at this time. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Hoyle, the director of Lincoln Lancaster Human Services, and I am here to speak on item 1D, the Keno Prevention Funds. So 5% um, of Keno proceeds from the city and the county go to this fund, and then it is awarded by a Keno committee that is comprised of a city council member, a county board member, and then three people from the community um, appointed by the city and three from the county. So before you, you have the recommendations from this committee. We were excited that we received more applications this year than we ever had. There are many grants, 15,000 apiece. Uh, we were able to award, as you can see, 26 of those for a total of 225,000. Uh, this is important funding in that it goes to prevention work in the community, prevention of um, gambling addictions, uh, family violence prevention, and then early intervention programs. It also aids with self-sufficiency and needs in the community. I'd be happy, happy to answer any questions you may have on that. Any questions? Nope, oh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come forward at this time to speak on our consent items? One, 
and two. Is there anybody else coming forward at this time? Seeing none, uh, let's move on to vote on the consent items. So you need to read each one, right? Correct. Okay. Item 1A, reappointing Kamaya Ramirez Russo, Roshan Pachanigar, Scott Hatfield to the Citizens Police Advisory Board for terms to expire November 17th, 2023. Introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded by Councilperson Rabel. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rabel? Yes. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Shob? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6 0. Item 1B approving the certification of the City Street Superintendent for a term from September 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded by Councilperson Washington. Any comments or questions? Are those Seeing dates, none. Are those dates right just for a few months? Yes. Not for all of next year? Okay. It is through all of next year. December 31? No, it's through the end of this year. 2020? Oh, 2020. Yep. Hmm. Heard me. Yep. Oh. Yeah, so same. Oh. Here comes the yes. email. Liz, would Perfect. you like to verify that the dates are right? Or not. And why? Director Elliott. Sorry, Director Elliott, too. Have you or come months. out of? No, thank you. I want to make sure that this is correct. But um, this actually does go for September to December of this year, but also all of 2021. Okay. So it is okay. for um, the rest of next year as well. Okay. So does that need to be changed? Or does we it need to right now? Our agenda says 31st, 2020. And then the resolution itself was a little longer, I thought. That's why I asked the question. So we are voting to 2020, December 31st, 2021 is what we'll be voting on. That is correct. Yes, the resolution does have both the rest of this year and all of 2021 on okay. it. Okay. Thank One you. That's wrong. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry about that. Thank that. you. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, please call the roll. Shobe? Yes. Washington? Yes. Ward? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Christensen? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6 0. Item 1C is approving MAMA HLLC to Hubby's Timeout Bar as a Kino satellite located at 2741 King Lane. Introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded by Councilperson Christensen. Any comments? More Kino money. Okay. Please call the roll. Christensen? Yes. Washington? Yes. Ward? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Show? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6 0. Like he said, more Kino money. More Kino. Item 1D approving appropriations in the amount of $225,000 for the operation of Kino lottery funds for various human services. Introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Been moved and second by Councilperson Raybould. Any comments or questions? This is a really good thing. <laughs> All these programs um, are wonderful programs, and I'm speaking up because uh, Councilman Bowers isn't here, and as the chair of the JVC, he would be saying exactly these kinds of things. So I will say them in his stead since I also sit on the JVC. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Just Council really one Rainbow. quick one. I was on the JBC for a few years as well, and it's this is like seed money. They take that money, these nonprofit organizations, and they leverage it, and they go out and get additional grants uh, and do more good in our community. So it is a very good thing. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, please call the roll. Washington? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Ward? Yes. Show? Christensen? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried yes. 6 there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Item 1E, approving a LPA program agreement between the City of Lincoln and the State of Nebraska Department of Transportation for use of highway safety improvement funds for right-of-way, construction, and construction engineering on the intersection reconstruction at North 84th Street and US 6 intersection safety project introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded by Councilperson Christensen. And just are we waiting for a motion? Yes. To? yes. All righty. I, um, I move that we accept the substitute agreement 
which corrects some items. Second. Oh. It's been moved and seconded that we have a motion for a substitute agreement. Any other comments, questions? Okay, seeing none, let's vote on the motion. Washington? Yes. Rabel? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Shom? Yes. Ward? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6 0. No. The no. main motion? No. Motion? I, that was the substitute agreement? It was a full substitute. So okay. we don't need to vote on yeah. that. No. Yeah. On okay. okay. Main motion. Yep. Item 1F approving the distribution of funds representing interest earnings on short term investments of idle funds during the month ended October 31st, 2020. Introduced by Washington. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded by Council Person Ward. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ward? Yes. Shob? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Rabel? Yes. Washington? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6 0. Okay, that ends our consent items. Let's move on to the public hearings. Item 4A is accepting and approving the report of new and pending claims against the city for November 16th through November 30th, 2020. Was there anybody that would like to come forward to speak on item 4A, uh, new and pending claims against the city? Anybody back there? Not yet. Okay. We can move on to the next item. Mm -hmm. Item 4B, Comprehensive Plan Amendment 20001, Application of the Urban Development Director to amend the 2040 Lincoln-Lancaster County Comprehensive Plan to adopt the City of Lincoln Affordable Housing Coordinate, Coordinated Action Plan. Director Marvin. Good afternoon, I'm Dan Marvin, and with me is Amy Hasse with RDG. We wanted to make a short presentation of this and then open it up for the public hearing, and we'll be happy to come back up uh, to answer any questions that you have. Uh, what you have before you has been something that's been in the works for a long time, um, probably for close to two years. And um, it started with a, uh, an RFP that went out that was responded to by our friends at RDG. RDG's got a history with the city of Lincoln. They worked on um, something all the way back to, I think, like 1990. Way um, back. And it was for an affordable housing related project. So we thought they were, uh, they were a, a great partner in this effort and um, they've worked tirelessly, and I think Amy will go through some of the processes that they were involved with. But in task number three of the RFP, it says that the plan should address um, rental and owner-occupied levels. Uh, it should define what is housing affordability. Um, it, it should be taken as a long-term vision for the community, and this being rolled into the comp plan i think that's exactly what's going to be done um it should look at the city as a whole it shouldn't focus on particular areas it should look at the city as a whole and it should identify champions to build on this um project so if you look at page 84 or no page 74 of the plan that is before you the highlighted areas is uh that we will that they should build strategic partners, uh, they should create a mechanism for sharing risk, um, preserving existing affordable housing units, expanding the number of affordable housing units, increasing mobility, uh, expanding neighborhood reinvestment, and ensure policies and codes that support affordable housing. All of these things, I think, are part of the plan that's before you today. And some of those we've actually um, taken an active role in doing. We've had meetings with the uh, planning uh, department, uh, building and safety, and urban development to address codes and zoning regulations to help enhance affordable housing. We've taken some of the pieces uh, that are TIF related 
to help build um, apartments at 60% area median income. So while the plan is coming to you today, I want you to understand we've actually been doing um, some of these elements for many months now. And we take, uh, I think you'll see some more pieces coming over the next month, whether it's uh, the Soto areas, redevelopment plan, or um, a couple of other projects that we have in the works that are redevelopment opportunities to enhance affordable housing. Um, and again, if you look at the implementing table, and I understand you can't read it off the Elmo, it's very small type, but the point is we do have champions. We have champions and not all the champions are going to be, say, City of Lincoln. There's many different partners that we need to pull together to tackle this um, program for affordable housing. And so we're leaning on the whole community. I noticed today you've got a letter of support from the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce is mentioned in, as one of our champions to help develop affordable housing, workforce housing. So we need to leverage a lot of different, I know you're just talking about leveraging. This plan leverages a lot of different individuals to help devel develop affordable housing. I want Amy to spend a little bit of time to tell you what she's been up to prior to COVID breaking out and us meeting with you in February when we first uh, released the draft plan. So Amy. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks again. My name's Amy Hazy from RDG. Um, it has been a pleasure to once again work with the city and all the great community leaders and staff that are here. Um, early in the process, uh, we, I, I always describe the first part of the process is there's two components to it. There's the data crun crunching part of it. So collecting the census data, collecting all the really great data that um, city staff has and that they have at their fingertips and kudos to them. I wish every city had the quality of data that we could get from the city of Lincoln. We combine that with a number of listening sessions and surveys because the data only tells us one part of the story. So we conducted over um, the, the time period, of, um, initial period of the, the study, over 24 listening sessions that were carried out throughout the community. And that involved probably six to 10 individuals in each one of those. So literally hundreds of people that we met with that we sat and listened to from young professionals to seniors, to our lenders communities, to uh, our landlords, to students at the university. So we covered a pretty wide range of individuals that we tried to touch to really understand what the big picture was as it related to, to housing. We also conducted an online survey where we had over 500 responses to that. Um, following the release and following our February meeting, we also posted the plan for public comment. We had hundreds of views off of the website reviewing the plan and took over 58 comments and incorporated those comments um, into the plan. So happy to answer any other questions that you have. Um, and as we move forward, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Amy. Do we have any other questions for Amy or for Director? Marvin. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be back. You can come back. Who else would like to come forward on this item? Age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me look presentable. <laughs> you look marvelous. <laughs> well, Chairman McGinnis, uh, members of the council, uh, my name is Kyle Fisher. I am the executive vice president for the Realtors Association here in Lincoln. Uh, our address for the record is uh, 8231 Beechwood Drive. Um, I appear before you today to say, first and foremost, um, the Realtors of Lincoln are among your biggest supporters and your biggest proponents of affordable housing. Um, as a collective of more than 1,000 real estate professionals here in Lincoln and surrounding in Lancaster County, the Realtors of Lincoln know firsthand the current situation regarding our housing market. Uh, for months, uh, maybe even for years, affordability has been sucked out of the market because the demand for homes in Lincoln has far outpaced the supply of homes. The question is why? And that's a multifaceted answer and it'd take more than my five minutes that I have before you today to answer. 
But the real estate professionals that are the members of our association would tell you this, we simply need more housing. I mean, that's the answer. And we need more housing at all price points, at all areas across town. You know, past policies that we've had as, as a city have in some ways hampered that growth. We gotta fix those problems in a lot of areas before we can really begin to address affordable housing in Lincoln. This lack of supply that we have is placing artificial pressure on the market in Lincoln as well. It's driving competition for existing homes, especially those priced under $200,000 to a point where the market has become somewhat unsustainable. In Lincoln, as of noon today, there were 70 total options for buyers or investors who look to provide rental housing to people, 70 total options that were priced under $200,000. And that's in the entire city of Lincoln. Of those properties, eight of them were condominiums, two were mobile homes, nine were townhomes, and 51 were single family homes. More than half of those properties were priced above $160,000. So if you're looking to be a first time home buyer in Lincoln today, you have 51 total options. That's not enough. Simply stated, we must build, we must grow, we must incentivize growth in the housing market at all levels if we wanna make any difference in easing the pressure on the current state of housing in Lincoln today. This plan, in the opinion of our board of directors, doesn't go far enough to recognize the role of growth. The association simply can't endorse it as it's written. Our association has offered at least one amendment to the plan. We also submitted a letter in May uh, as feedback to the Urban Development Department and to the consultants. Unfortunately, none of those suggestions made it into the final version of the plan either. So if this council sees fit to incorporate our text amendment, delay a vote on this resolution for a week, I think the Realtors Association of Lincoln as a collective would be willing to sit down and look at it again. I wanna close by saying thank you for your time. And I really wanna thank the mayor's office and the urban development office and this council, quite frankly, for its focus on housing. It's a commitment the administration has made and they're following through on that, true to their word. I think we all want the same goal, whether it's realtors, whether it's members of this council, the administration, anyone in the community. The real issue is finding a way to get our differences to mesh together on how we get there. We think that path forward is through incentivizing all housing to people so that they can move from renter to first time home buyer to their forever home and possibly whatever they decide to do when they move to being an empty nester and beyond. I think we should all try and get there together. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Yes, Council Person Ward. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know, Mr. Fisher, you mentioned sending letters to urban development and the mayor's office. I don't, I don't know that council. I know I did not hear from you. So, um, so this feels like last minute. And can you talk about why now to the council and why we, why we should support a delay at the last minute? Yeah, no problem. I, I know the consultants uh, had uh, discussed it. Uh, I think Dan Marvin, maybe when he comes back on rebuttal, can talk about it a little bit more. Um, our association was part of the listening sessions that worked with, with the uh, consultant. We provided an hour's worth of feedback. When the initial draft came out, none of that feedback, unfortunately, made it into the draft plan. Um, we issued our comments, if you will, during the public feedback period. Um, we did so in a very detailed uh, letter and red line requests to the Urban Development Department in May. Um, and again, not their fault. It kind of languished for a while. And then the draft plan came back around as a final version before the council, or sorry, before the planning commission. And none of those uh, red line suggestions were made in the plan. And so, you know, I can't address as to why or how, but then it's taken us, what's uh, the time to planning commission now, two weeks uh, to develop what I would call a small text amendment that may be able to change the opinion of the association. So last minute, yes, that's what it took to get the right language. And certainly we tried before that. I guess just to reiterate, I mean, that's why the councils here had, you reached out to perhaps more of us before the chair today. There may have been some time, and maybe you did. I'm just saying, I, I did not, was not made aware of this till about less than an hour ago. 
Yeah, and that's what I'm saying is unfortunately the final development of the language didn't happen until today. And that's just it is unfortunate. The yes. fact that I couldn't come up with it before then. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Council person Rabel. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for coming down. And just to follow up on Councilwoman Ward's comment, is there any way that we could get um, a copy of some of the concerns that the association had so that could you share with us that list or the, the draft that or the corrections that you had requested so that we can see yeah. that as well? Because that, yeah. that would be helpful. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you very much. That would be great. Any other comments? Okay, thank you. Mr. Fisher? May I? Takes me a while to get organized here. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Fred Hoppy. I'm a lawyer in town, and I happen to be an affordable housing developer. I'm kind of, that's my space. And my family's been doing it a long time. I, I, we had started our first lumberyard in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1903, I think, at 27th and Capitol Parkway, uh, after my granddad had worked for a lumberyard at 9th and S Streets for years for several years. Anyhow, back in the day, providing lumber was affordable housing, especially if you'd, if you'd sell it on credit. So anyhow, uh, it was how housing finance was done. But be that as it may, my family's been pretty active in developing affordable housing in Lincoln since way back then. We partnered with, well, I guess we didn't partner with the McGinnis family, but got some ground from them. We've got a number of the, the uh, affordable, really, workforce housing subdivisions in town today have our name on them. That's the space in which I work. I build affordable housing. Haven't built much lately in Lincoln because we've been going out state. And why? Because when you build affordable housing, the cost to build housing now is too much economically for the rents we want to have and have to have to call it affordable for the scope of of 60 percent 80 percent median income families and below in other words it's an economic thing the sticks and bricks that it cost me to put together when you amortize them out put them in a sale price and, uh, and put them in someone's hands on a purchase, or you create them into rentals, require uh, rents that, that are higher than, quote, affordable. Consequently, and this is, uh, I'm here off the get-go to support this plan. I mean, it ain't perfect, and I'm, I, I'd be the last to say it, and, and I'll give you a few of the ways it's not. But it's a plan, and you aren't going to get anything done toward solving affordable housing unless, number one, you have a plan, and number two, you have goals. This has got goals, and it is a plan. And we can work with the plan as it goes along to make it more efficient, but the fact that it has goals is totally important, and it's got measurable uh, concepts in it to help us bring affordable housing to Lincoln. Not the least of which, and probably the most important of which, is the fact that in the affordable sphere, in the 80% median income and below, and particularly in the 60% median income and below area, it is, is targeted and has got the concepts in there that, hey, city, you have to help. Other people have to help. We have to have, come together to provide, to get affordable housing. And it, it's a recognition and a work for that. I see it personally as an opportunity, not only for realtors, but for builders. 
Every activity that's, that is discussed in the plan is an opportunity for a realtor to sell a house or to put a renter into a house. Every opportunity that's talked about in the plan, to me, is an opportunity for a home builder, either to build a new home or to remodel an old one. And so I'm like 100% in this, the plans. I'll tell you, I haven't built in Lincoln for a while because I've been asked to go to other towns and use my, my capital there where the community comes forward requesting, demanding us to build affordable housing. That hasn't happened in Lincoln for a long time. But what this plan does is it, that's the message I get out of the plan. It's, hey, come to Lincoln, we need affordable housing, and we're going to try and set in motion a way to help you. Bring it. And you can't do it without it. That's probably my time limit, and mm -hmm. I could go on. Uh, and the, if there's a flaw in the plan, I will say, it is the, the non-recognition in the strength it deserves of the importance of the private sector to get affordable housing built, particularly in the scope of which your plan demands. The plan calls for 500 units a year for the next 10 years of 60% median income and below housing, assumed primarily rental, 400 units and below of more or less workforce targeted 80% median income and below, conceptually. And in that context, um, I mean, I see those as uh, demands for opportunities for us, but uh, significant and important. Uh, but what's missing is the call to include and uh, get the realtor community and the home builder community engaged all the way in bringing affordable housing forward. And when, when we talk, that there's some concepts that are really important that you have to kind of visualize almost. Affordable housing, that language says to me, housing for 60% median income and below. Housing affordability, that talks to me as attainable housing. Housing that is the best price for somebody that's, that is 100% median income, 200% uh, whatever. But housing works its way up. Every new house, and you can't meet this plan unless there are new houses. Every new house should open one up for someone else that then might be affordable. So I'd answer any questions. Any questions uh, for Mr. Hoppy? Nope. Thank you, thank sir. You. I like your mask. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Santa Hoppy. <laughs> Santa Hoppy. And I like your mask. Even response to Santa Hoppy. I like it. <laughs> Santa Hoppy. <laughs> oh, mask stuck on my earring. Sorry about that. Anyway, good afternoon. My name is Ann Post. I'm an attorney with Baylor Emden Law Firm. I'm here today, today on behalf of the Home Builders Association of Lincoln to testify on this plan. So we'll start to say that the Home Builders Association of Lincoln applauds the city's efforts to develop the City of Lincoln Affordable Housing Coordinated Action Plan. However, it can't support the, support the plan as written today. So first, I want to start by thanking all the people and organizations who volunteered their time to help develop this plan. Housing affordability, as I know you're all aware, is a complex and multifaceted issue that doesn't have just one solution. And we commend the efforts to actually... I, to root out and look for the root cause of the issue of the problem and also to put together concrete measures to impact housing affordability in Lincoln. So with that there are several aspects of this plan that home builders support. 
Uh, these include expanding the use of tax increment financing for housing uh, as a tool to help share the risk of development and bring down the cost of housing. This also includes a review of codes with an eye towards supporting affordable housing. Um, with a comment on that section of the plan, it, when we read it, it says review of codes and points out some specific zoning code issues that can be looked at to address it, uh, to address affordable housing, such as parking requirements and expanding uh, more middle, uh, missing middle housing and just more variety of housing by right under the zoning code. We'd want to ask to make sure that we don't stop at just the zoning code. We need to look at, uh, at, take an expansive view of codes in Lincoln, including our building codes, which of course safety should never be compromised. First, safety should never be compromised when it comes to building codes. Um, however, sometimes uh, when codes are adopted, as part of the review process, there should be an analysis of the increased cost to housing and just a weighing of the cost to how the benefit of the code improvement to the cost of housing. Uh, so example, I know that this was done when we looked at the recent adoption of the energy code. We want to thank you for that and say that needs to continue and be done on a more systematic basis. And so while there are some components of the plan that HBAL supports, we can't endorse a plan that takes tools to achieve housing affordability off the table. Specifically, this plan recommends against the use of sanitary improvement districts, um, S or known as SIDs. These are used widely in neighboring communities and may be a tool that, when tailored to meet the needs of Lincoln, can be used to increase Lincoln's housing supply. We recognize that SIDs don't generally lower the cost of housing, but restructure it. So this does limit their ability to be used in the strict, and that gets back to Mr. Hoppe's comments, the strict affordable housing context. However, they could be used to increase attainable housing in the community, taking uh, pressure off Lincoln's market supply, and also those, um, the market pressures that raise the, cost of, uh, raise the cost of affordable housing. And so this is why HBAL can't support a plan that would uh, take one piece to benefit one segment of a housing market that may affect other segments of the market um, in a negative way. So while HBAL can't support the, cannot endorse the plan as written, we do believe that targeted amendments could result in a version of this plan that benefits the Lincoln housing market as a whole and that would enjoy widespread community support. So and again, thank everyone who worked on this plan. Thank you for your time um, and thank the efforts to put this plan in place. Um, while at the same time, and we would welcome efforts to delay it for a week so that there could be an amendment for a plan that the community, wider community could support. So thank you very much. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer. Yes. yes. Council person Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Post, thank you for coming down and presenting this. Um, I am curious though, because I might have missed it in trying to listen so hard, but what is the piece that H-Ball thinks is benefiting one segment and hurting the other segments of the market. Could you be clear about that? So for example, the, um, the statement that sanitary improvement districts aren't something that the community should use, <clears throat> which I think that we think that if we take that away as a tool, it, um, if we take that away as a tool, because it doesn't benefit the affordable housing segment of the market, that it may eliminate it as a tool or move us towards eliminating as a tool to help the attainable housing or just that step up where we think it could be used to create more supply. Okay. And so it would be negative in that impact, okay. negative to that segment. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Post? Okay. Thank you. After you're done speaking, can we have you exit uh, the chamber at this point? And is there anybody else out there that would like to come forward? There should be two more people at least. Okay. Jane Kinsey with Watchdogs of Lincoln Government. Uh, we would say delay it because um, the public needs to know what this is. Uh, I search things out, but I don't know exactly what it is. Are you building uh, this all over the city? Are you building it down by Antelope Valley? What? Um, 
it's important to have the community behind this, not just low-income people and people with power. And if you don't have the information out to the public in some fashion, then you can't come to a public hearing and state your case. Um, the, um, as a housing bubble at this time, we had it back uh, maybe 10 years ago when high inflation, uh, people were giving, um, given um, mortgages they could not afford. Um, Wells Fargo was one of the companies that has had to pay billions to get that taken care of. So the issue may not be just giving people $5,000 so they can buy a house. Um, it seems like you ought to have Habitat Humanity information. They do a wonderful job, uh, not with the volunteer work particularly, but uh, they come out in the public and take excess uh, building materials and uh, refurbish them and they make, make money off of that. They are grassroots, they are efficient, they take something from nothing and make it. Uh, the public needs to know what kind of houses are you building um, in this idea. Some people in the market for a house may find it threatening as I say, more public information about this if you are going to delay it, which I think is a good idea. Uh, the question of a TIF. Um, Lincoln has depended on the TIF for years. And I would like Mr. Um, Mor er, Marvin. <laughs> can't think. Marvin? Right, Marvin, I was going to say Morgan, uh, to let the public know how much percent of uh, the government money is in the TIF, because there is a tipping point. And if you promise this to this people, and you've got these ho uh, huge uh, TIF um, developments downtown, uh, sky-high $700,000 condos and so forth, um, we need, the public needs to know exactly what the tipping point is here uh, because everybody wants a tiff. The, um, it seems like, and I don't know if you can do it in a week, but it seems like the two groups that have given you some negative feedback and have asked for a public hearing delay and uh, as I say, representatives of um, organizations uh, who deal with low-income housing and particularly Habitat for Humanity. Um, get them all together if you can. This doesn't seem like um, this is something the government wants to do without talking to the public uh, or the private sector. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Kinsey? Seeing none, we have another speaker. <laughs> Any other way? One side or the other. Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished council people. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Wayne Mortensen. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of NeighborWorks Lincoln, uh, and I've had the pleasure of working with some of you since my arrival in July, uh, and I hope to work uh, extensively with the rest of you as we move forward on this plan and this work together. Uh, NeighborWorks is the most prolific developer of affordable housing in Lincoln, uh, and it's uh, unlike uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Fred Hoppe, uh, we're not going anywhere. We work exclusively in Lincoln and are required to by charter. Uh, we've been doing that for 35 years. Uh, the housing market dynamics that have made this such a great place for the home builders and the realtors that talked earlier uh, are conspiring to prevent us from really accomplishing our mission to uh, expand and create affordable home ownership throughout the city. Uh, and I'm rising in support uh, of uh, this tremendous work 
uh, that was uh, done for this plan as it's written today. The work and insight that went into the authorship of the plan uh, was nothing uh, in comparison, though, to the dialogue and agenda setting it has already had since it was released in February. Uh, the st housing stakeholders across the region, the civic leaders, uh, are all very excited about the potential for this to move uh, this agenda and this issue forward to create more equitable and inclusive neighborhoods in Lincoln. Uh, I moved my family back to Nebraska after 17 years out of state uh, just this last July in order to be uh, a, a, an assistant uh, to agendas and visions just like this one uh, and to help lead uh, NeighborWorks Lincoln into the future. Uh, both I and my organization uh, are prepared uh, to meet this moment and advance this plan in close collaboration uh, with city staff and stakeholders. This plan is a stake in the ground that accurately captures where we are at and a framework for partnership and for innovation that charters the course of where we need to be. Uh, it, it is, uh, and it necessarily emphasizes those making less than the area median income. Uh, those families are the service workers, the teachers, the public servants, and the retail workers that keep our economy moving forward. And currently, the housing market has failed them uh, dramatically. Uh, it's not functioning for affordable families, and we haven't had, we've had until February to have this dialogue. Uh, the best time to move forward on this plan was yesterday, but the second best time is today, uh, and I implore you to do so. The facilitation of more equitable neighborhoods will help Lincoln uh, leverage its strengths, its housing market strengths, and believe me, I've worked in Cleveland and Washington, D.C., New York, and St. Louis, uh, and never have I worked in a, a housing market so robust and so stable as the one in Lincoln. And we need to leverage that strength, uh, not worry about whether what we do will uh, diminish it in some slight way. Uh, this plan will uh, contribute to Lincoln's economy being more resilient and inclusive uh, and better positioned to confront the generational challenges that we face, be they social, economic, or environmental. Uh, those issues have begun to rear their ugly heads, and they've only been the beginning of what we will face in the coming years. I strongly urge adoption of Comprehensive Plan Amendment 2001. Uh, it will place the city a, on a better trajectory for additional resources, partners, and implementers in this continued fight for housing access. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Nope. Seeing none, thank you for thank coming you down. Much. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else who'd like to come forward at this time to speak on this item? Would uh, Director Marvin like to come forward for any rebuttal? You brought a team with you. I this brought time. my whole team with me. <laughs> Dan Marvin, Urban Development. Um, let, I took some notes while other people were testifying, and I, I don't know if I want to call it rebuttal because that's kind of um, has some negative tones to it. So um, I, I will say the reason I started talking about the RFP that selected RDG and the, and the tone of that RFP was that this is an affordable housing action plan. It is not a housing affordability plan and there is a there is a there are there are a lot of elements there in the transposition of those two words um, we we care a lot about the people who really have to struggle that does not mean we don't give a hoot about people who don't have to struggle but we do care about people who are making two thousand dollars a month and a thousand of that is going towards rent leaving them very little to live on for the rest of the month. <clears throat> so we have focused in an affordability, in an affordable housing action plan, and geared it in that direction intentionally. It is not a slight to people who are fortunate to live in $350,000 and $400,000 homes. Not at all. And in truth, what, what Amy has written into the plan is a, a discussion about creating mobility. 
We agree with the realtors. We need to create a plan that has mobility. So you will see in that plan discussions of senior housing, other types of housing, because we recognize that a lot of people, um, when is our poster child for this, who live in a house that is way more affordable than what she should be living in. So we need to be able to create <laughs> options to get her to move so that they can free up that. So we do believe in mobility, and I think that we are compatible with much of what the realtors have said in regards to creating mobility. Um, and to Fred's point that we need to we need to show love for the people who are swinging the hammers and driving the nails. We absolutely should, because you don't want me out there building it. It's not gonna, you know, things aren't gonna, things are probably not gonna work right. So we, we, we definitely recognize that this is an industry-driven thing, and it's how we can provide help to that. And there are a host of financing tools that this plan is riddled with, which I don't think we have the time to go into, but we definitely want to create more tools in terms of risk sharing, risk spreading, because those are financial tools that can create opportunities to build things quicker, and by risk sharing, those methods help drive down costs. I was a little surprised by Ann Post's comments that they couldn't support it, because in truth, when we had this same plan before the Planning Commission and testified in the form of a neutral position. Um, but we're, we're on a teeter-totter here, and I think that if there are amendments that can get everyone on board, we would absolutely be supportive of that. Um, there were comments about Habitat for Humanity. Um, we did go out, Amy went out, Wynn went out, and they met literally with 200 people as part of that. And I'm betting 99.9% .9 that they did meet with Habitat for Humanity. So we've met with all the different stakeholders in this community, which is how you got the plan before you. The last point, and I think this is, an, a, this is an, a, a point that Ann brought up, which was SID districts. Um, we obviously, there are pages in here that don't support the use of SIDs for affordable housing. And Ann says that they're not a tool for affordable housing, that they might help create more of this mobility that we speak to. I think that that's a huge policy shift in the city of Lincoln. And I don't know that that's appropriate in this particular element because it divides school districts, it creates um, servicing of water and sewer over the, over the ridges, out into the county. That's a completely different animal. But what I have said consistently is, are there tools that we can do through assessment districts, which are, can be part of the plan and are part of the plan, to help do some financing of infrastructure within the boundaries of the city of, of Lincoln so we can still grow the city the way we'd like to. Those are elements that are in the plan and we need to explore those. And I think that if we do, we can find a happy compromise in that respect. So those would be my comments and I would open it up for questions. And as you can see, I have, have a team questions? of people. Council person show. Go first. No, you may go first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Mr. Marvin, thank you very much for coming forward. Uh, this is a plan. We're going to vote today on a plan. Is it possible to come back later and amend this plan if we get more tools and better ideas? And what happens to this plan after we vote on it? Does it become part of something bigger or does it become enforceable? Well, David's here, but I think, <laughs> I think he can tell me if I'm wrong. It will get folded into the comp plan it, as, as a standalone plan. Sorry, Amy. Plan. But Sorry. <laughs> but yes, it, it can be amended. But what I've, what I've told your chair is, and I take this seriously, we're not creating a plan that's going to go on a shelf and sit and collect dust. So the purpose of the plan is to create momentum 
to deal with affordable housing. And so the plan, if, it, if it's worth something, I think has already been doing that because you've seen the TIF projects that we've had that help secure additional affordable housing and you'll see additional efforts in that. So the purpose of a plan is to create momentum towards a goal of affordable housing. Um, if there are tools that become available, then by all means let's amend the plan and stick those tools in there. Um, so I think it is a, it is not as as Wynn would say, it is not the first and last time we look at affordable housing that's an evolution towards an end of trying to create more opportunities for affordable housing. Thank you. You fine? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I'm not fine, oh. actually. I am, I'm <laughs> pretty fine, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a few questions. Okay. Um, so I was curious about the amendment process. I'm glad that uh, a fellow council person brought that forward. So someone could, we could, as a council, amend this plan in, in the future. future. Um, but I have a couple of questions about uh, some items that were brought forward. So the SIDs that are not in this plan, um, they're not prohibited, right? So this plan doesn't say we will never look at SIDs, we will never address them, or they cannot be used. It just does not bring them forward as a tool, as a tool for affordable housing. That's correct. Okay, that's good to know. And then I know that um, uh, Ms. Kenzie was concerned that the public did not have enough opportunity to participate in this planning process. And just so everyone's clear, did this planning process, did this draft come out last February for public review, or was it, did it come out in, in May? It came out, I mean, I was all before you guys in, in February, just as the pandemic was hitting. I think it might have been the end of February. And we had all these plans on public open houses, and we had to shift it to a plan of doing it through Zoom and, and other uh, electronic versions. Um, so we were kind of the pioneer of that. but. The plan was released um, in February okay. as a draft plan, and we took comments and incorporated them in on page 92, the comments that we did receive. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for now. Yes, council person. Christian Chen. Have you seen the amendment proposed, amend page 84? That, yes. Uh, yes, I have. What's your opinion on that? Uh, I've told the chair that we don't, we're, we're not opposed to, you don't like me calling you the chair? No, no, that's fine. I just I mean, messed up call me director, and I apologize. <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with the, the, the amended language. I mean, if we, we would like to have all parties behind this because um, division, I think, is, is going to impede our ability to move forward. But... Um, I don't think that I don't think these are um, huge changes. I consider them to be modest. Okay, council person, Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to talk a little bit about that process, um, Director Marvin, if we could, um, and why. Um, clearly, that realtors felt that they weren't being heard until today, um, and if I guess. Help me understand if you felt that this was appropriate now to include why it wasn't included before today. If in fact, all things being equal, um, they had got the message or had given input to the department appropriately with the amendment that we're looking at today. I, I just, I mean, the surprise element is not, I, I, don't, I don't like last minute things. I don't think it's, I'm not accusing anyone. I'm just saying I wanna be helpful to everyone but I don't know that we can do it appropriately, and here's why um, I don't want the delay, is because we've heard um, from the chamber, we've heard from NeighborWorks Lincoln letters, we've got letters from Appleseed on the record, we've got letters from south of downtown. These are all organizations that support the passage of this today. So if we were to pass this today, and as you say, we can make changes in the future, as my colleagues have asked about, just, could you just talk about how that would work or why, why we're at this uh, juncture right now? Well, 
We, we did receive a letter from the realtors. We received a letter on May 15th, which was within the deadline. Um, and and, and it, if truth be told, I called Kyle and solicited him to send a letter. Um, so we, we, were, we, we wanted input um, and, I, and, and <clears throat> did call him and asked him to send a letter in. We did receive it on the 15th. Amy's here, I don't know. I think I'm, I, I'm not gonna be one that can speak exactly to the process of how we took all of those different comments, but what we did was we bundled all of them up we sent them to RDG, and then we created categories, and we've double-checked that the comments that we received specifically from the realtors did make it up to RDG. But Amy, I don't know if you have any other comments, or I don't mean to put you on the spot here. No, that's okay. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, so um, as Dan said, we, we took those, we reviewed them, and, and and we tried to look at them through the lens of what we saw was our directive, which was looking at how are we dealing with, um, especially housing for households making less than 80% of our area median income. So we really tried to look at all those comments through that, that lens to see how they, they fit into what we saw as our, as our mission. Okay, so that's how. That's, that's how we, and like I say, again, I think there are, there is a there is a gulf between an affordable housing plan mm -hmm. and a housing mm -hmm. affordability plan, and within that, there may have been some confusion from the realtors as to exactly yeah, where I understand we were headed. That. I agree. I I just want I don't want to disenfranchise those organizations that are supportive by putting in something new that they may not support, and so that's why I would like to move forward without this delay or amendment that's what we know is in the report today and that's what we've all supported and so i just want to be clear to my colleagues and to those listening and to you um, for that reason so okay. thank you for that clarity both of you thank you very much any other questions mr chair would it be possible to ask the question of mr carey sure i know it's David Carey, Director of the Planning Department. Hi, Mr. Carey, thanks for coming forward. We've had a small conversation about affordable housing and housing affordability. I think one of those belongs to this one and one of them might belong in the comprehensive plan. Have you had any discussions about housing affordability as part of the comprehensive plan? Can you give us some timelines, some ideas on where we are on that project? Certainly, yeah, I, I think that's a, a very appropriate way to have that discussion is within the comprehensive plan um, and that's where well, first of all, it's appropriate to have a conversation about affordable housing as well, which is why we're proposing to have that, this amended into the comprehensive plan. And that's what this, your action would do on that. Um, when it comes to the topic of housing affordability, that is, I would say, kind of the, 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 the bigger holistic picture of how housing is handled in, in its entirety in our community. And absolutely, that's a topic that should be and is in the comprehensive plan. Where we're at with that topic with the update of the comprehensive plan for, to become the 2050 plan is that we currently have a proposed uh, future growth scenario out for public um, consumption and comment uh, in a virtual event right now. Uh, and that will be open through the end of this calendar year at least. Um, and along with that is a, uh, the beginnings of, of a land use plan that would go with the comprehensive plan. That growth scenario envisions all the growth that has been predicted and, and uh, out to the year 2050. And so the housing um, supply and the need is, is being assumed in those discussions. And so our current plan and the new plan will continue to support the necessary infrastructure growth to build out to that housing number that's needed based on our population growth. So I would say that our current plan does that already and our new plan will also do that. Um, it'll change because we're adding 10 years to the discussion and to the horizon. Um, the challenge is that that doesn't always equate to housing affordability necessarily. Um, and so that's where we get into more of this discussion about what else can be done to help support that mobility in the housing market that Director Marvin mentioned uh, and, and it, that discussion is part of this affordable housing action plan. 
So I guess that's a long way of answering yes, the, the, the comprehensive plan is a place and perhaps the, the most important place to have the bigger discussion about making sure we have enough land and development um, set up so that we can meet the demands of housing for the future. Um, but we need to continue to talk about how can we make housing as affordable as it can be here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And that, I'm not going to stand here today and say I know exactly how to do that, that that needs to be an ongoing discussion. And as Dan mentioned earlier, that, you know, the, these, the, the suggestions or the idea of using some type of special assessments is certainly able to be done and could also be done more. So I think that that's a direction that, that could be useful to go, on, to go in and talk about more. Uh, thank you. I'd like you to also talk about my question to Mr. Marvin about amending the plan. I'm going to get the names mixed up. Right now we're talking about affordable housing, which will be part of the comprehensive plan under housing affordability. Are those plans always amendable? Can we always go in and change them, or are they written in stone once we vote? No, they, I, would, I would say they're never written in stone. Um, certainly, first of all, we update our, the comprehensive plan every five years. Um, in a major way every 10 years, which is what we're under right now, a uh, major update. These plans that we adopt by reference in the comprehensive plan, these plans therefore become the guide for the topic area that they that, that's focused on. So this is the affordable housing. Portion of the comprehensive plan. Right. So, th so we will look to this plan for guidance on discussions for policy development, for uh, other, other funding options. Um, and yes, that also can be amended um, certainly, if there's an identified need, uh, perhaps some time has gone by and we tried some things, some of them have worked, some of them haven't worked, and we want to update it. So, yes, absolutely that could happen. So if new tools came along, we could add those in, or if tools that are ineffective, we can take those out. Correct. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I have one for Director Kerry. Um, we've created SIDs in the past, and like you said, some were successful and some weren't. But... Is there an ordinance out there that says we cannot create an SID today? No. So we could come forward with an SID today? Someone could. Uh, certainly that would be under discussion and review. Um, the, the answer is that it's a legal mechanism, certainly in the state of Nebraska. Um, so it has not been our uh, typical way of doing development <clears throat> on the edge of our community. So you're saying is it in the plan that says somewhere that SIDs are not encouraged or do you know if there's anything in our comprehensive plan that talks no, about I would, SIDs? No, what I would say is that our comprehensive plan speaks to and points towards the policies that we're currently using. Okay, so in a way our comprehensive plan is kind of telling people don't come forward with SIDs at this point because we're not encouraging them. I, I would agree with that. I think we're, yeah. we're definitely not encouraging their use. Okay. Um, okay, any other questions for David? Okay, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else like to come forward? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing on this item. Thank you. I'm going to call the next item. Item 4C. Approving a multi-year CIP construction contract management system upgrade between the City of Lincoln and Masterworks by Origo Software Technologies for a five-year term. Would anybody like to come forward at this time to speak on this item? Mm, no movement? Okay. Okay, see none. Let's move on. Item 4D, approving an amended memorandum of understanding with Lincoln Public Schools regarding school resource officers. I'd like to come forward at this point. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Denise Pierce and I'm with the Lincoln Parks and Recreation Department. I'm here this afternoon along with Chief Blymeister in the back there uh, to talk a little bit about the revised Memorandum of Understanding regarding school resource officers. Uh, briefly, by way of background, uh, the City Council adopted the Safe and Successful Kids Interlocal Agreement back in May of 2018. Uh, that agreement covered three areas, community learning centers, mental health funding, and school resource officers. 
At the same time it adopted the interlocal agreement, uh, the Council also adopted a separate MOU outlining the roles and responsibilities of school administrators and school resource officers. Shortly thereafter, the Safe and Successful Kids, or SSK, Interlocal Board was created with three elected officials from both the city and LPS. The Parks and Rec Department was tasked with staffing the SSK Board, and in that role, the department works with LPS, coordinates with city law, and LPD on issues related to SSK work, including uh, issues regarding school resource officers. So in 2019, the Nebraska legislature considered bills related to school resource officers, and the legislature ultimately adopted legislation that directed the Nebraska Department of Education to adopt a model MOU, governing school resource officer programs across the state. The state law says that we have until January 1st, 2021, uh, for communities and school districts with school resource officers to either adopt that model MOU or to adopt an MOU that is substantially similar to the model MOU. So the Department of Education actually drew heavily on our local MOU as they were drafting its model for state programs. There were, however, a couple of differences, and that's what led staff for LPS in the city to draft what you have before you today for consideration. So we have, um, in the MOU before you, there's three primary areas that we've made changes. First, if you take a look at section two of the MOU, you'll see some new languages there in items five and six uh, that require LPS families be notified of certain LPD and LPS policies regarding school resource uh, officer interactions with students. This section also requires LPD to collect data regarding students who are referred for prosecution, and you'll see that language in part seven there. Second then, if you move on to section three of the MOU, you'll see quite a bit of new language regarding training, training requirements for both school resource officers as well as school administrators. And then third, if you take a look at section four, uh, the MOU now requires that LPS families be notified of LPD's process for accepting complaints regarding school resource officers. Uh, the term of the MOU you will find in Section 7. It will run through August 31st, 2021. Um, after that point, the MOU will automatically renew unless either LPS uh, or the city decides not to renew and provides the other party with notice. Going forward then, the idea is that this MOU will uh, run with the fiscal year, similar to how the separate SRO funding agreement between the city and LPS works. So staff briefed the Safe and Successful Kids Interlocal Board on these changes to the MOU way back in March 2020, seems like a long time ago, <laughs> right as the pandemic was starting. Um, the LPS Board of Education then adopted this revised MOU at the end of last month. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chief Blymeister. He's got a couple things that he wants to cover and I will stick around if I need to answer questions. Good afternoon, members of the council. Jeff Blymeister, Chief of Police. Uh, so LPS and LPD have had an MOU in place outlining responsibilities. However, the recent passage of LB 390 set forth additional requirements and necessitated modification of the existing MOU. It's important to know that the required additions to our MOU surround communication of processes and practices that had been in place. As Denise mentioned, the Department of Education relied on our existing MOU as their model template for the state. So based on the specific language incorporated because of LB 390 into state law, the following additions were made. And Denise mentioned section two, and these changes involve codifying notification to Lincoln Public School families of LPD policies regarding the interviews of students when a student is advised of their constitutional rights prior to that interview and interrogation. So our policies related to SRO interaction with youth are made publicly available on our homepage under the transparency document. These policies are also available on LPS's homepage under school resource officers. While our policy involving SROs was already accessible by the public prior to this legislative change on our website, it is now on both sites. And we believe in a large part our transparency with the public is the availability and the accessibility of as many policies as possible. 
and we will continue to make publicly available any policies that are not investigative or strategic in their nature. Um, section three goes into the training requirements for SROs, both for specific training required as well as the timeline for receiving that training. And so we have been an accredited police agency since 1989, and part of that accreditation revolves around training modules on an annual basis that are mandatory. And these include some that are mentioned in LB 390, conflict de-escalation, ethics, implicit bias, diversity and cultural competency, just to name a few. So as a result of this process and our commitment to providing the best training possible to our SROs, we were able to get several officers trained as trainers for the instruction on policing the teenage brain, school-based law enforcement, and understanding adolescent behavior. This allows us to provide this timely expanded training for officers who are selected as SROs and meet the requirements providing this training within six months of their appointment. For example, in 2019-2020, 12 SROs had a combined total of 986 training hours. 462 of those were specific to SROs. Denise mentioned Section 4, and this is the process for leveling complaints against any officer. Once again, it's made publicly available and has been for a long period of time on our homepage. And now with the passage of 390, it is also available on LPS's homepage um, under the School Resource Officer tab. There's a focus on the ability to make a complaint against school resource officers, and we embrace that level of accountability. The reality is, is that clear policy directives that follow accredited police best practices through CALEA, combined with quality personnel serving as SROs, have prevented a large number of complaints. I mentioned the training hours in 2019-2020. In the 2019-2020 school year, our 12 SROs received a total of four complaints. However, they received 19 commendations. And one of these commendations, while the commendations, excuse me, cover a wide variety of situations, I'm especially proud of those that involve de-escalation in very tense situations, some which involve students with developmental issues. In addition, I'm also aware of at least one commendation that comes to mind where the SRO assisted a student who was having very serious issues at home, and that pathway of communication led to outstanding outcomes for that student. Um, we mentioned also that LB 390 requires that LPD shall keep a record on student referrals for prosecution. That prosecution relates to um, assaults, narcotics, disturbing the peace, larcenies, vandalisms. Um, and this is once again our current practice and our agency has been involved in improving student outcomes and decreasing disproportionality in arrest data for years since my time and before my time as Chief of Police. So once again we're here to answer any questions. We are proud of this MOU. I want to give um, a lot of credit to Denise Pierce. Denise is still here, who worked very hard on this, and we'll try to answer any questions you may have. Do we have any questions for the chief? Yes. Uh, chief or Denise, can you talk a little bit about the community outreach, um, reaching out to members in our community, like the Malone Center, to get their input and feedback on some of the changes that have been made since um, the initial MOU was proposed and their thoughts. Absolutely, I can comment on that. Um, if we go back a couple years prior to this legislation coming into play in 2019, we had worked with community partners with LPS to take in any kind of um, input in so many different fashions. Formally, we all met together. Uh, once again, that was prior to the pandemic and we took all of the comments and we collected them, we answered the questions and the concerns or addressed them and combined that information into that model S or MOU that was originally passed. That same model MOU that later was used as a model for LB 390 and now is in place. And so uh, the community partnerships once again is inherent 
and critical to what we do and will be part of the processes going forward. Add one thing, Chief. Uh, a couple years ago, as we developed the evaluation tool for the SRO program, uh, there was, we held a community meeting and took a great deal of community input as we developed a matrix. We took um, lots of emails, lots of comments that we got at this public meeting and developed a three-paid matrix that we then used to develop the evaluation program. So the, at the SSK meeting in November, we had the first annual report on um, the SRL program. You can find that report on the city's webpage. Um, keyword is um, SSK. You can find the report there. You can find the matrix there. You can find all sorts of background information on the SRL program. Any other questions for our two presenters? Seeing none, thank you for coming down. Is there anybody else who would like to come forward on this item? Jane Kinsey with Watchdogs of Lincoln Government. We went back through this at the start of it. We had meetings all over the city. We had people coming from every aspect of life. I can't even remember how many that I went to, and the authorities even had more. Everybody is uptight right now about emotions of many issues, political, racial, economic, etc. This is a good feeling thing to attempt to manage that, but it isn't going to manage it. The problem of children who act out begins in their home. Whatever that home is, that is where the problem begins. And until the community realizes that that is the issue and that all the do-good things that they can do later on is not going to change that. It's unfortunate that the police department has to to make the modifications for this because the job is not on them. The job is at the home. I've been gratified to see on television that the governor and his wife have been talking about providing adoptive homes for these children who have come from terrible conditions, that more needs to be done about that. And even before that, we need to have the courts stand up and protect children from the horrible things that occur in their homes. So um, you can approve this. The legislature can feel good about it. But until we do something, about people who abuse their children knowingly or no unknowingly, you're not going to solve this kind of a problem. And I would also speak to the school system that does not have the kind of discipline in the home, in their uh, facility that they need to have. It's unfortunate that a police would have to come and even be in a building because there is not the type of environment to keep that in check. This isn't a new idea. Many communities many years ago have had police come in and meet with children and form a bond or a connection. So, um, you can approve this, the legislature can, but it is not going to solve the problem. 
we have to recognize that some people cannot be parents. And we can't wait for them to grow up while the children suffer. There has to be an intervention of some type. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anybody else that would like to come forward at this time to speak on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we can move on to the next item. We can vote on our public hearing resolutions. We have 40, or do we need to? Um, oh, excuse me. My apologies. Are we? we are on 4E. Right. Item 4E is assessing the costs incurred for cutting, clearing, and removing weeds against the various benefited properties for the period of January 1st, 2020 through December 31st of 2020. Is there anybody that would like to come forward on item 4E to speak? Or in our weed control? Okay. I don't believe we have any out there. So we can move on to the voting session. Okay. Item 4A, accepting and approving the report of new and pending claims against the city for November 16th through November 30th, 2020, introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded by Councilman Christensen. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Raybould? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6-0. Item 4B, comprehensive comprehensive plan amendment 20001 application of the urban development director to amend the 2040 lincoln lancaster county comprehensive plan to adopt the city of lincoln affordable housing coordinated action plan introduced by ward so moved second and moved and seconded by councilman christensen yes councilman christensen mr chair i'd like to move a one-week delay so we can have considered the amendment that was offered to the council just before this meeting began So I hear a second. I will, I will go ahead and second that. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we have a one week delay on the voting or public hearing also. Voting. Voting only for next week. Do we have any comments? Yes, Councilman Schrobe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Christensen, thank you for your motion and a chance to speak. But there was a conversation about some new language. I anticipated that to be added as an amendment today. Are you saying we should wait a week to get that language cleared up? That's what the delay is? Yes. Just to consider the language we discussed earlier. Correct. For the amendment. That's, that's my question. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Councilperson Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one more comment again, which would be to say, I would like to go ahead and pass this today, but keep the door open. We know now we can amend and change as we move forward. Um, based on what we heard from our directors today. I certainly want to be helpful to all sides and include what, what others want, but I don't think there's time, even in a week, to do so. So okay. I will oppose the delay for that reason. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Councilperson Rabel. Um, I'm, I'm gonna support the delay. I think it's, it's common courtesy, and because again, this is the first time we've heard of any, any concerns about uh, what had been proposed and has been out there for quite some time. So, you know, our doors is always open. We we get plenty of emails. Uh, we enjoy reading plenty of emails. Mm. That's part of our job, mm. and we encourage that that level of communication. So, um, for that reason, I want to have more time to delve into some of the concerns that have just been presented tonight because we have been talking about affordable housing for a long time how important it is to our community mm -hmm. and we've been also talking about housing affordability but i want to make sure that i understand what they're trying some of the amendments or the concerns people had how it ties in to what is being presented and presented here for us to vote on and if it's impactful enough should it be included or not just haven't had the time to really dig into some of the concerns because we haven't heard about them Okay. Yes, Councilperson Washington. 
I haven't made up my mind whether or not I'm going to support the delay, but I will say that if we choose to delay, I would like it to be hearing and vote. This is a resolution, and I think that Councilwoman Ward brought up a very good point um, that uh, before we got to this section that uh, we have received many letters uh, in support of this coordinated action plan, and uh, this has been on review for a long period of time. The public had a chance to do that, but this new language has not been on review. And I want to give the public a chance to review and then comment. You okay with that? What? I, I, I'm just fine with making it public hearing and okay. and a vote next week. Sure. So, the second's fine with that. Of too. course, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So we could hold open the public hearing and the vote for next week. Thank you. Okay. My only other comment was is, is they talked about one of their main goals in this was to build a strategic partnership and to get everybody in. This is a community document, and I want to like to have the community feel like they were all part of it. And um, this amendment, as it's been proposed so far, is very simple. And both David Carey and... Dan Marvin and the mayor's office have all agreed that it would be okay to have as part of the plan. And so they didn't have any objection to it at all. And I just think it's very important to build the momentum with our community on this plan, because I want everybody behind it. And it's gonna take everybody to solve this problem. Yeah. And so that's why I'd like to at least have a one week delay and then we can make the decision next week. Yes. Councilperson Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just on that comment, I think Director Marvin did say he did solicit input from the realtors. So to be that inclusive, so I think that all attempts have been made to include the community. Okay. So Councilperson Chobe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't remember hearing a timeline or a deadline. Are we, for lack of a, under some pressure to get this done quickly? No. I don't. I don't remember any testimony saying that. I'm wondering. I honestly, I expected an amendment now and us to vote today and move forward. So that's why I'm asking that question. Is there, will, will a delay be detrimental? Not that I know of. I could have somebody answer the question. Hey. Somebody smarter than me. Here he comes to say. <laughs> Just on this area. <laughs> Just on this subject. Yeah. Uh, Dan Marvin, Urban Development. I, there, are, there are no pending other bills that uh, hinge upon this being approved today. So a delay for a week will not impact other other items that will come before you. Thank you, Mr. Marvin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilperson Ward. Director Marvin, would it be your opinion that a week is enough if in fact some of the council wants more public input to respond to what we thought was already the action plan and now we have other input coming well, in? I mean, when does it end, right? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that that what has been shared with um, with urban development from from the chair and what we've circulated amongst the different departments is um, I think I, I think the total number of words is probably around thirty out of a out of a ninety two page document. So it, it was it, it, we we could evaluate the impact of that and I certainly um, I don't want to say that the original language was perfect and the other language is better or worse but we, we, we could evaluate what was being nominated and that it was um, it was certainly workable and we could review that in the hour or so before this meeting started. Will that be communicated back to the previous stakeholders and the, those people that are supporting or, or thinking they understand what they're currently supporting? Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I want to make sure yeah, that we're I, all on the same page. If, in fact, we're going to do this, there's the, a lot the of honest investment. Answer, the honest answer is probably not. You know, I think that it would be, it would be communicated back to um, stakeholders through um, the media <laughs> and other elements. So we're not, we're not going to advertise because... As, as I know there's not a formal amendment, but I do know that in the past, and, and this 
goes to a time in the past. But in the past, we've been able to put amendments and post them next to the item. Um, and that would be a form of advertisement as well. So if you did have a, if you didn't have a formal amendment, you could post that next to this item before next week. And I think that would be a mechanism for the public to be able to review the, the language change. Okay. Any other questions? Um, a comment. Yeah. Um, Mr. Marvin, thank you um, for being clear about how we might be able to post these two paragraphs so that the public could read them and understand what we are looking at this week. Um, that was the purpose of my suggesting that we allow for testimony or public hearing and a vote next week, okay. that people would have a chance to read these two paragraphs. Okay. 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 Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Marvin. Let's call the motion for the one week delay. And this is for public hearing and vote, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Raybould? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Ward? No. Shob? Yes. Washington? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 5 1. Okay. This will come back to us for next week. And again, like you said, let's see if we can get that some of this language posted. So people came forward to testify and we listened to them, right? Yeah, they can. I mean, we've had other emotions to amend that we don't post all the time. So. Right. But, but never changes to the comprehensive plan, probably. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, let's go on to the next item. <clears throat> Item 4C is approving a multi-year CIP construction contract man management system upgrade between the City of Lincoln and Masterworks by Origo Software Technologies for a five-year term. Introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. second. And moved and seconded by Councilperson Christensen. Any other comments or thoughts on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Christensen? Yes. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Raybold? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6-0. Item 4D, approving an amended memorandum of understanding with Lincoln Public Schools regarding the school resource officers introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded by Councilperson Christensen. Any comments? Questions? Yes, Councilperson Washington. I want to thank um, everyone who had a chance to put their stamp on this MOU to work on this. Uh, I want to commend uh, the City of Lincoln and LPD uh, for being the role model for the state in crafting an MOU. Um, I think it shows that Lincoln has been working diligently in this area to be, uh, craft programs that are equitable and transparent and really hold teachers, police officers uh, to a level of accountability, which is comforting. Very much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Washington? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shoeb? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Ward? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6-0. Item 1E, approving a LP. Have one more. Oh, excuse me. 4E. Totally off. 4E. E. Assessing the costs incurred for cutting, clearing, and removing weeds against the various benefited properties for the period of January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Introduced by Ward. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded by Councilperson Washington. Any comments or questions about weed cutting? Okay. Seeing none, please call the roll. Washington? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Ward? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6-0. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item.
number five, public hearing and ordinances for second reading. I'll be calling items 5A and 5B together, amending the pay schedule for the employee group whose classifications are assigned to the pay range prefects by the letter C by creating the classifications of operations analyst and transit dispatcher, and amending the pay schedule for the employee group whose classifications are assigned to the pay range prefects by the letter C by deleting the classification for planning assistant. Good afternoon, Council. Doug McDaniel, Human Resources. Uh, the first ordinance uh, for 5A creates two new classifications for the uh, LTU, Lincoln Transportation Utilities Department, one being an operations analyst uh, and the other being a transit dispatcher. Uh, both of these are, will be in the C pay ranges, C34 for the operations analyst and C18 for the transit dispatcher. Uh, the other ordinance uh, is eliminating an unused classification, the planning assistant. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have on any of those. Do we have any questions for Mr. McDaniel? Yes, Council Person Yep, yeah, Mr. McDaniel, this doesn't create new positions for new hires. It's, it's just reclassifying uh, existing positions? It does create new positions that are within the budget. Uh, again, taking uh, duties out of, you know, the, in the transit dispatcher, for example, that work is being done by field supervisors. And again, it takes them away from supervising employees directly. So we've, you know, within the budget created this new position of a dispatcher, allowing the field supervisors to truly be out in the field supervising rather than dispatching. The operations analyst is a new position as well in LTU to uh, really work within analyzing data to refine business processes within LTU, create dashboards and things such as that. So there will be new positions, but they are within the budget. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. McDaniel? Is there anybody from the public that would like to come forward on items 5A and 5B? Uh, not seeing any, not seeing any. Well, let's move on to items 5C, D, and E. Item 5C is amending the pay schedules for certain employee groups by allowing a one-time lump sum payment for employees whose classifications are assigned to the pay ranges prefixed by the letter W. Amending the pay schedules, item 5D is amending the pay schedules for certain employee groups by allowing a one-time lump sum payment for employees whose classifications are assigned to pay the ranges prefixed by the letter E. Also, item 5E is amending the pay schedules for certain employee groups by allowing a one-time lump sum payment for employees whose classifications are assigned to the pay ranges prefixed by the letter X. Council, it's this time of year that we normally uh, um, consider the cost of living increases to the uh, pay schedules. Uh, the WEs and Xs uh, pay plans are all unrepresented employees across the city. Uh, we will not be doing actual increases to the pay plans uh, because of some of the budgetary issues that we've faced this last year. <clears throat> Pardon me. We will, however, be doing a 1% a one lump sum increase to employees in all of those categories. So following the same suit as to what we've been doing in terms of our labor negotiations as well. But these are unrepresented employees. Any questions for Mr. McDaniel? Yes. So I am just want to be sure of what we're looking at here. I remember reading some st stuff in here that we're looking at 1% and for, for a lump sum payment. And then some other group is uh, 0.75, is that correct? Or is there, are they both 1%? That'll be next week, Mr. Christensen. Okay. <laughs> All right. For, for labor agreements. Got it. All right. So these are for our unrepresented employees, WEs and Xs. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Councilperson Raybould. Just to clarify, this is a one-time lump sum payout. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I, a, I guess I have a follow-up question on that. So how will this one-time lump sum payout affect the withholding tax on these employees? Is it going to, is there a way to mitigate the fact that, like when I get a big lump sum, I get a huge chunk taken out? How about well, these folks? Employees will be aware, and if they want to adjust their withholdings, they certainly can. 
uh, or in the eyes of the government, tax is tax. I don't want to be cavalier about that by right. any means, but they will be aware that they're getting a lump sum payout. It could push them into a higher tax bracket for greater withholdings, but that'll be a personal decision. And if they want to change their withholdings, they can. We don't necessarily advise that, but that's their own, that, so that's their own decision. what would be the timeline for this, this payout then? We'll probably be doing the timeline over the next 30 days, somewhere in that frame. Could be after the first. Most likely. I mean, we're going to have to work through the payroll systems. Give them a year to adjust. Mm -hmm. right. um, one other quick question. Was this part of the budget for all these um, departments? Yes, I believe it is. Okay. So we had money in the departments to give out lump sum payments. Correct. In lieu of cost of living adjustments. Right. Okay. So that's my understanding. So. And that was your question. <laughs> yeah, I had the same question, but I recall during the budget conversations, we were hoping that employees would right. uh, be flat, and I don't think they could negotiate zero. And 1% is better than the cost of living. And so there was that's a little accurate. give on both sides. Mm -hmm. But when, again, that's under labor negotiations. These are our unrepresented employees. Trying to, These are unrepresented. Trying so. to treat them in the same manner, the rest of our employees, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Would anybody else like to come forward on items 5C, D, or E? Anybody else? Nobody going once, going twice? Okay, we'll move on to the next items. Item 5F, amending Chapter 2.76 of the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to the <clears throat> personnel system by amending Section 2.76.385, funeral leave, to clarify the language when funeral leave is allowed for certain employees and repealing Section 2.76.385 as here to existing. And 5G, amending Chapter 2.76 of the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to the personnel system by amending Section 2.76.405, Absence without leave to clarify the language and repealing section 2.76.405 as hereto existing. On item 5F, uh, this uh, language is to clarify as we were going through, we discovered uh, that we really had a section that was not included in funeral leave, so um, unintentionally excluding a benefit from the groups that should have been, and these were not in the right order. So we've worked with the law department to reorder these items. It does not extend any greater benefit. It just clarifies how funeral leave is utilized for the people who are covered by code. Okay. So. 5G. And G is a uh, amendment, um, and, and this happens for absences without leave. Uh, the previous language was really about uh, someone who has absented themselves for three or more days uh, of, uh, without authorized leave shall be deemed to, before the language said, resign their position. Well, really, when someone has abandoned their position, they've abandoned their position. It's not a resignation. It deals with how we deal with payout of you know benefits and things such as that. So we're changing the language to really say it's abandonment of his or her job rather than a resignation. So. Okay. Any comments or questions for him? Okay. Anybody from the public like to come <clears throat> forward on either 5F or 5G? Thank you very much. Seeing none, we can move on. Item 5H is change of zone 20031, application of Grisela Diaz de Leon Garzo from R2 Residential District to R4 Residential District on property generally located at 131 Northwest 22nd Street. Uh, Director Carey. Good evening, David Carey, Director of the Planning Department. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Um, I did not see anybody waiting outside, so I thought I'd just jump right in. <laughs> uh, this uh, change of zone is before you. Uh, I went to the Planning Commission. It did receive unanimous uh, approval on from the consent agenda. This is a pretty straightforward request for a change of zone. We are in support of it. The R2 to R4 will allow uh, for additional units to be placed on this uh, location. Um, I can put this up on the Elmo just for reference so that we see where this is located. Hmm. Come on. 
comes up. There we go. Uh, this is out at uh, 131 Northwest 22nd Street. Uh, really what this is going to do is allow for uh, the minimum lot width uh, effectively when you have attached single family. Uh, under R2 zoning, that requires a 40-foot uh, lot width. Under R4, you can do the attached single family with 25 feet lot width. Um, that certainly makes it much more doable. We can get the density there. allows it to make sense to do this. Uh, redevelopment. It does meet the uh, a lot of the intentions of the uh, comprehensive plan um, to allow for some reinvestment and redevelopment and infill residential development. Uh, so we are in support of this item. Um, and with that, I can answer any questions you may have. Anybody with any questions? My, I have one. Yeah. So do you? <laughs> Go ahead, I Council. Have, uh, I've got a, a couple of questions sure. just so that I understand. Um, and I think the planning commissioners brought this up. There was a sort of a question of spot zoning in this area. I mean, we don't have a, there's not a lot of development out there right now. And what we have out there right now is R2. So we're changing that. Could you explain, I think the second, um, the second lot plan showed uh, the, the intention is to increase R4 besides beyond this one. Could you talk a little, that's the one. If you could talk a little bit about that. And then while you're there look at the drawing, could you please explain if there's an alleyway being created between the properties on 23rd and the properties on 22nd? So I believe the, the alley is un, unimproved but, but existing. It's not being requested to be vacated at this time. Okay. Uh, to answer the, your other question, um, so the reason why we are confident that this isn't and shouldn't be considered spot zoning is because when you look to the east side of 22nd Street, um, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And the way we look at this, uh, all the way from O up to Q Street, that this would be appropriate to rezone that entire area if, if there were applicants that were interested in doing that. That this area makes sense, this would be an improvement to that area. Um, the reinvestment would be a good thing. And so we view this as not being spot zoning because first of all, this is a significant enough piece on a corner, um, which makes sense. And then also that we would look at future um, proposals in support of something similar. Okay, thank you. And that is the H zoning across Northwest 22nd Street, correct? 22nd Street? Well, Northwest, I'm sorry, what street is it? Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Northwest 22nd. And that's H on the yes. east side. Yes. And how far back does that go? Okay. Uh, actually, this this shows that. Yeah, a that shows. There's out there. Okay. Those four lots that are up front, I guess are, are all owned by the state of Nebraska. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a, <laughs> interesting this. So the state DOT does own the, those front smaller two lots and so we basically did pr took the opportunity to clean that up to make sure that the zoning was consistent all the way down to that right of way okay <clears throat> okay okay great thank you very much you bet thank you is there anybody else would like to come forward on this item at this time Is there anybody out there? Anybody looking like they want to come forward? David said no. Okay. <coughs> we can move on to the next item. Item 5I, ordinance approving an interlocal agreement with Lancaster County to reorganize the governance structure for and approve articles of dissolution of District Energy Corporation. Good afternoon, everyone. Chris Connolly, Chief Assistant City Attorney. This is the kind of agenda item I like to come up here on because I'm not asking for any money. So <laughs> start with that. Thanks. Uh, anyway, uh, District Energy Corporation has been around for over 30 years and has provided heating and cooling for th this building as well as other public buildings that the city and the county own, uh, as well as providing energy for uh, the West Haymarket area. And um, uh, they are in the process of reorganizing again. This is something they have done a couple of times over the years uh, in an effort to uh, gain some efficiencies uh, in their business model 
And uh, I, in 2016, when I became a corporation, they later discovered that they have a, a conflict of interest uh, in the way that the voting members uh, can, can operate because um, if you're a county commissioner, you can't vote, uh, you, you have a conflict of interest when you're voting in the best interest of the corporation. So uh, the decision was made to return it to an interlocal agreement, and so that's what we're doing here. There is, uh, there is no change in the operations, no change in the makeup of the board. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Tammy Ward continues on the board, and Mickey Esposito will be the new member. And uh, otherwise, uh, you won't see any difference in the way uh, it operates. They'll still continue with the meetings, and the operations will continue as normal. So. Having said that, if you have any questions, uh, have any I believe questions? Mr. Austin is here also if you have any <clears throat> questions for him. Have any questions for Mr. Connolly or Mr. Austin at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Okay. Thank you. We can wave to Mr. Austin. <laughs> <laughs> you can go on out the door with him. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Do uh, we have anybody else out there that would like to come forward to speak on this item? Uh, seeing none, we can move on to the next item. I'll be calling items 5J, 5K, and 5L together. Approving the Terminal Building Redevelopment Agreement between 947 Terminal LLC and the City relating to the redevelopment of property generally located at 947 O Street and adjacent rights of way in downtown Lincoln. And the related um, item 5K, amending the fiscal year 2020-2021 CIP to authorize and appropriate $3.9 million in TIF funds for the Terminal Building Redevelopment Project. And related item 5L, authorizing the issuance of tax allocation bonds for the Terminal Building Redevelopment Project in the amount not to exceed $3.9 million. Yes, Mr. Levy. Good afternoon, almost good evening, Mr. President. Uh, Council members David Levy, Barrett Home Law Firm, 625 South 14th Street here in Lincoln. With me is Mike Works of Rev Development, the developer on this project. Natalie Williams from my office is also here. I understand that brevity is the word of the day, so I can, we're happy to answer any questions, of course, <laughs> and we appreciate the Council's time and consideration of these items. I can go through a little bit of a presentation of the project if you'd like, or we can go straight to questions, whatever the council prefers. Most of us know what the project is at this point. So I think we're okay with that. Do we have any questions for Mr. Le Levy or Mr. Works? I was just wondering about his sanity. No. <laughs> but this project, yes. this is going to be a great Could, project for Lincoln. A brief timeline, where you expect to be, how long do you think the project will take type thing? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Mike works in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I th we'll be starting demolition uh, this spring, probably in January, and hope to have the first residential condos up and running by May or June probably more like July or August when I say that. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll also be renovating the first floor and have a new tenant for the first and second floors. Um, so that'll be a complete renovation and that should be done roughly the same time frame. So I think you'll see drastic changes wow. by summertime. Yeah, I really think you will. And there was a conversation about vaults under the front sidewalk and the front scape. We're gonna fill in the vaults and then all of that sidewalk gets ripped up and um, and we've been working with planning, so it, it's, I mean, it'll be all the downtown requirements and um, upgraded, upgraded amenities throughout. So, I mean, we're excited about that, too. I think the whole first floor will look completely different. Glass, you know, first floor and mezzanine all the way up, all the way around. Um, the entire parking lot's getting basically ripped out and redone um, as well to the south. So, um, yeah. And, and the streetscape improvements will go along the north frontage along O Street, all the way along the 10th Street frontage to N Street and then on the east half of the N Street frontage. So really it'll be the, the east half of that entire Correct. block will be done streetscape improvements as part of this, uh, as part of this project. And we're really doing it at the same time because we're involved in the 9th and 0 Holiday and Express. So we're doing it at the exact same time that'll be done. Wow. I got that's a smile under the mask, you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's impressive. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you're also going to rehab the elevators so there won't be the same wonderful experience of being stuck between floors. 
Well, okay, so I don't know all the history of that. <laughs> <laughs> two, two of them, we've been told, were redone in 2018, so after the fire. This um, was... The third one, we are completely gutting and redoing, yes. The freight elevator, yeah. Yes. And you did say you are, they are removing the vault underneath, yeah. so Correct. the city, you yeah. will have no liability to the city to rent to release those vaults, okay. That's yes. Right. And yep. then... Um, and, and we are, I just want to say, we're, appreciate asking we're asking the council to vote on the resolutions piece of this today i know that's not your normal practice but it's a huge help in terms of the financing getting a redevelopment agreement to the bank before the end of the year which again to your question councilman then allows them to Timeline. get moving on this very quickly and and well on that topic i really i do just want to again to the council thank uh, dan marvin and and hallie salem and uh, Abby Luttrell and the city attorney's office. They've, they've been great to work with on this project and patient with us and um, You know through the challenges of 2020 and all that. So we really appreciate that and appreciate the city's flexibility and uh, Working with us on this. I think it'll be a great project. I Do too yeah. Okay, any other questions for our applicants? Okay, seeing that Thanks very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. You have the right to stick around and rebut anybody else that would come forward if you want. Make the circle, I guess. Yeah. 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 Is there anybody else that would like to come forward on this item? Is there anybody out there that would like to come forward? Three of those, right? On 5J, K, and L. Dan saying no? Okay. Mr. Chair? Uh, since 5J and K are resolutions, and this is not stepping outside our normal uh, process, and it's been requested that we approve these today, I'm going to move approval of item 5J and 5K. Second. second. And moved and seconded by <laughs> Councilperson <laughs> Raybull. Um, other discussions, thoughts? The sooner they can keep moving, the better. This is another good thing mm -hmm. for the city of Lincoln. Here, here. It's an icon for entrance into the city too, so it, it will be a good project. Yeah, I really appreciate the repair of the terracotta. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Go ahead and please call the roll on approval of 5J and 5K. Christensen? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Washington? Yes. Ward? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carrying 6-0. We will take on 5L next week. Okay, Mr. Chair, on. we just approved J and K together in one vote. Is that? She read them both. It's that, everybody's okay with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just. Nobody's gonna vote differently, I don't think. No, they're not. We're gonna vote the same vote, it's just. Yeah. yeah. We've been scrutinized recently for following our procedure, so. <laughs> Well, they can chastise us if they want to. Okay, let's move on to ordinances, third readings. 6A, I need a motion to. Tammy, you um, I'll move to uh, bring the item from the table back. back second. Us. And moved and seconded to bring the item back. Uh, I don't know if that gets discussion. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. It's a priority no, I don't think it requires. So let's call the roll on re bringing this back up. Washington? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Ward? Ward that recused oh, herself. Ward. Okay. McGinnis? Yes. Okay. Motion carried by zero. Six A is back on all right and i am going to offer an amendment last week when i uh offer first, to talk first. About. uh yes we do because we need a motion to approve the main week. motion first oh okay uh, that's right we haven't done that okay. would you like me to read that yes go I'm ahead okay. and read it now and find out who the okay. person is item 6a amending chapter 2.56 of the lincoln municipal code Relating to restrictions on participation in lotteries by amending sections 2.56.010, 2.56.020, and 2.56.030 to add definitions to define key terms and to allow agents or employees of a satellite location or sales outlet to play the lottery when not on duty and repealing sections 2.56.010, 2.56.020 and 2.56.030 of the Lincoln Municipal Code as, oops, excuse me, as hereto existing, introduced by Raybold. So moved. Second. 
been moved and seconded by Councilperson Washington. All right, now I'm going to offer an amendment. It was passed out earlier. It's motion to amend number two. When I pulled this Good. from the Second? Second. Been Thank moved you. and seconded. Now. When I pulled this from the table uh, last week, it was at the request of Councilman, Councilman Bowers, who had um, brought this matter before us. He also wanted to amend the language so that it uh, did exactly what he wanted it to do. Uh, the amendment is in the last section. So it's a subsection C, no, section three, subsection three, C, three C, C. pardon me. <laughs> um, and it's just a, a further definition of what the sales outlet is and uh, when an employee would legally be able to play and when they would be prohibited from playing. Uh, the upshot is the same. Employees cannot play while they're on the clock, but once they have clocked out, they, they, this, um, when this uh, ordinance would allow them to uh, participate in keno activities um, where they work as long as they were not on the clock. Okay. Any other questions <laughs> on this motion to amend? <clears throat> nope. Seeing none, please call the roll. Washington? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Christensen? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 5-0. Now, since we just amended, we need a, mm -hmm. any comments or questions on the main motion as amended? I would just say good work, uh, Councilman James Michael Bowers. Uh, this, is, this brings us into probably more a closer agreement with all the other communities in the state in, of Nebraska. In the world. Uh, we were kind of standing out as a, uh, an exception, and I think this is a reasonable step to take. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, please call the roll. Christensen? Yes. Washington? Yes. Chauve? Yes. Rabel? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 5-0. Okay, at this point, well, we'll go on. Resolutions, first reading, correct? I'll correct. let you say it. Resolutions first reading, section seven are items seven A through seven K. Okay. Our ordinances first reading and related resolutions are items eight A through eight D. Okay. Our pending list section nine is items nine A through nine C. Okay. At this point, usually at about the two-hour break, we usually take a break, but I'm going to say let's go ahead and keep moving forward. If I everyone like what is you okay think. with yes. that? Yes. Sure. We're okay with that. Okay. We're at the point of a public comment. Go ahead, Sony. I'll let you run with this. I'm, do we have anyone in the chamber in yes. Bill Luxford? Yes. yes. Or the hallway? We have Please two come forward. people at this point. Come on down. <laughs> How are you today, young lady? I'm pretty good, thank you. I just have some things for the people. Hand, hand those to the young the clerk. And you can pick either one of them. Oh. You need one extra. I got another one in my bag. Each folder goes to. Yep, one apiece. Hi. Danke. Do you need one for her? Five minutes and she states your name and address. Uh, I'm Adrian Schmidt. I live at 2107 Northwest 84th, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. I live in the uh, I live in the county, actually. Uh, I brought a little prop with me today because I do believe that we went down to shop the block uh, on Thursday night, November the 5th. It was a beautiful night, and we went down early because of COVID. We wanted to, of course, be safe. Uh, we had made one stop. Got my bag. Um, my friend Pam had paid for us to be down there. 
We were on our way to our second stop, and we were uh, walking along the uh, south side of uh, Starbucks between, uh, let's see, uh, between 12th and 13th Street on P. Uh, walking along, just minding our own business, talking about our next stop, when I was hit from behind by one of your scooters, your little motorized scooters. That sent me flying down. I don't remember anything except finding myself on the ground. Now, I want to make a point clear that this young lady broke my leg with the scooter. Mm -hmm. It was not the fall. I lit on my left side. My right side is the side that's broke. Um, I went to the emergency ward of the hospital. I was in a lot of pain, um, shaking uncontrollably. Uh, wanting to throw up, but couldn't because, of course, we hadn't eaten. Uh, when I was in the emergency ward of the hospital, see, I think this is a very senseless accident. It should never have happened. Anyway, the doctor came in to let me know uh, what my scans were, and he came racing in because he said, I've got to get in here because I've got stabbings to take care of. So he informed me that I did not have brain bleeds, but I did have a broken leg. So it goes on from there. Um, I just feel that we have put all the first responders at added duty with these scooters. You know, you had the, the policeman who came to the hospital. He couldn't get to the, the site on time to see me before I left. <coughs> then, there, of course, there's the medic team. It wasn't medic one because, of course, they were out somewhere else, so another team had to come. Then there's the emergency ward with the doctors. I spent the night in the emergency ward because there wasn't room in the hospital. When I was in the hospital after the <coughs> surgery, they were opening up another floor for COVID patients, which, of course, we don't want to be in the hospital at that time either. Uh, I know this is a pilot program, um, and I have, I know what the rules are for this pilot program. Uh, they are not allowed to be ridden on the sidewalks. <coughs> um, they're supposed to be 18 years old to ride these scooters. Uh, they're supposed to have a valid driver's license. Uh, these girls, two of them I know for sure. One was maybe 16. And the other one had just celebrated his 17th birthday. Uh, I am really disappointed because these scooters are not being real well regulated. I see them downtown laying all over. <coughs> I was talking to a lady at church today and she said oh, I was down there the other day and there was another one riding on the, the sidewalk. They are toys to these people. They are young people riding them. They are not your 18 year olds. They are not a form of transportation. They, that just isn't what it is. What you see there is what I'm living with right now. That is my hip. I know it looks like a knee, but that is my hip. There were 21 staples, and now I have that scar that runs all the way down there. And the other thing behind there is what he put in there because, because the break was so far up on my hip. So I'm, you need to get rid of the scooters. Please don't let this happen to somebody else. Um, and they are not being well policed. I talked to my um, police officer just yesterday because I wanted to know if he ticketed all three of the young ladies because all three of them broke the law. All three of them were riding those scooters on the sidewalk. He only gave the one ticket. Now, if my friend and I were driving and speeding, we would both get a ticket if we were pulled over. You know, he only gave one. And then the young lady went to court. She got a $25 fine plus court costs. I pay more for one of my prescriptions I have to take right now than she paid for her fine. Um, and it says here, any person who violates any provision, this is from your ordinance, any provision of this chapter, including any permit condition, okay, shall be guilty of a misdemeanor, which shall be punishable by a fine not exceeding $500 per violation or imprisonment for a period not to exceed six months 
by both such fine and imprisonment. And of course, I knew the young lady wasn't going to go to jail. But we aren't even following these rules. You know, and the police, they can't be monitoring these. You'd have to have somebody down there all the time. They're laying all over the place. They are not being put in their stations. I have yet to see a station. And they are, you can't tell me that these, this, this bird thing is picking these things up at night and sanitizing them. And they're supposedly, there's a whole bunch of rules if you read what they're supposedly doing. I don't see anybody taking care of any of them when I've been down there. Of course, I haven't been able to be down there for five weeks either because, of course, I have been a little laid up. I've got six to eight months of rehab here. You know. Excuse me? Can you wrap this up? We yep. And I want you to know that that little card that's in there, that's my volunteer work. That's an animal that's been here in this building a lot. It comes, they come <clears throat> out of uh, <clears throat> Chicago, Illinois. I can no longer work with her because I don't have the mobility right now. And they are harder for people to work with her. You have to be a handler. You have to have training. So you have cut that out of my life too. And these, you got to go back. And it says here, the city determines via resolution of the city council that the shared mobility device pilot program is contrary to the health, safety, and well-being of the residents of the city and should be terminated. You can terminate this. And I know it's not coming up for review until September, but it needs to go now before somebody else is hurt. Okay. Uh, my name is Pam Folsom. I live here in Lincoln at 9332 Northern Sky Road. Um, I am not a frequent shopper downtown Lincoln. I am not real familiar with the bicycles, other than I know now that they have bicycle lanes. I've recently moved back to Lincoln over a year ago, so a lot of this is new to me. But finding the bicycle paths and the roads downtown have been a change. I understand that, but uh, I don't understand these, uh, these uh, scooters. The downtown Lincoln promotion of uh, Shop the Block was a way to get people downtown. A great idea to get people downtown. But I came downtown and I was blindsided with these scooters that were everywhere on that we walked. They were in the intersection of the crosswalks that laying there, they were on the sidewalks, laying there, actually we walked around them while we were talking and walking, and as we were walking down the sidewalk after we had made one stop, on our way to another stop, that's when all of a sudden I got whipped around. My friend, the other friend that's with us is just getting over hip surgery who was standing next to me walking and Adrian was walking in front of me as we were walking, I got totally whipped around out of the blue. I mean, here we're talking and enjoying our evening that I bought tickets to go to, to be in downtown, got our age group out of the house, downtown, and here we are. I'm getting whipped quite around, and I turn around, and I see my friend in front of me get hit and down on the ground, and I watched her head bounce off the ground. She's not much of a woman, but she hit her head and she bounced. So there we are. We have three girls going through us on scooters. And the one going, oh my God, is she hurt? Is she hurt? Well, hell. She stopped. They all stopped. They were responsible enough to stop. And they stayed. And I appreciate that. But one girl goes, I rang my bell. I rang my bell. So that's what she thought she had to do while she was on the sidewalk? No, I'm not very, I'm not impressed with this decision. It's a pilot program. And I contacted the downtowners immediately the next day and she goes, oh please, please do not let this die. She said, contact whoever. She said, we will take, we will take in consideration that we, you know, she took our names and everything. She goes, we need you to this is, there's been a lot of issues. She said, keep on this. Well, the three of us were enjoying our time together, 
but we were assaulted downtown. And it took a long time. I, I was told somebody, call 911. I'm trying to deal with her because she blacked out. And when she came to, she was trying to get up. We're trying to leave her down on the ground. And then finally, some citizen came up and was calm with her. And, and she must have been an EM, had some instruction or a nurse. So she sat there and talked to her. And then here's our other friend who just just getting on her cane from her hip surgery trying to pick up her glasses, which she was hit hard enough, her glasses flew, and they were on the street. And so, you know, at least she, we got her glasses and put it together. Well, this one girl was, I think, 14. One was celebrating her 17th birthday. How did they get on these? And the other one probably was 17 as well. How'd they get on there? I don't know. All the witnesses that came forward to us, they gave us their names and number. Even the people from the Starbucks came out and said, this happens all the time. Somebody's on the sidewalk all the time. Well, that's a fact. <clears throat> Look where they're laying. They're laying there. They run out of time, they drop out. They just lay them there. Well, while we were standing there, after the emergency came, the ambulance got her, took her off. We have the the fire response team is there with me and my friend, the other friend, Kathy. And we're sitting there, and here comes bicycles. <laughs> bicycles! We have to get out of the way. We moved back. The fire captain and I and Kathy moved back so the bicycles could run in front of us on the sidewalk. Now, this is not a police issue. They cannot be doing this. They don't need to take the time to do this. This is, needs to be policed some other way or get rid of it. And in the same time, as Adrian is taking off in the, in, in the ambulance and these scooters from these three girls are laying there, here comes one of their kids, their friends. He must have been maybe 14, 15. He picks up a scooter and takes off. This is a free night for scooters. They were letting, there was a promotion, evidently that they're allowing free. So they didn't have to go through, from what I understand, some type of, you have to have a helmet, you have to be, have, you know, use your signals, and you have to be on the street. So here goes this kid. And then I know, personally, I know some of my friends' family, their children, they come downtown on weekends and they use these things. They use them as a toy. They're not going from here to the school or here to work or whatever. They're playing. <coughs> They're just using them for toys. Is this what you thought this was program was going to be? If it is, I think you better consider this a little bit more seriously. And this is not the only accident that's happened, and it will not be the last. And I don't like to see what happens to somebody that she never had an issue before this. She has never had a broken bone. Now she's got a broken hip and she has to take antibiotics for like the next six months and any time she goes to the dentist she has to take an antibiotic because of a stupid incident on a sidewalk where there should not have been. This is my statement and I'll stick to it. <laughs> I you. wrote to the city council. I wrote you guys. I did get a response from a couple of you. Then I got a response from the transportation department going, oh, here's the whole, what, like nine different bullets. We let everybody know that they're, they are responsible, that there is no writing on the sidewalk. They're trying to cover their ass. Who's out there policing this? If this is what they want, somebody better be out there watching it. And it isn't the police. If you decide you want this, will you go out and watch and see where these people are on these scooters? If you're going to take the responsibility to say yes to a program like this, well, then you better take the responsibility to the re results like this. Okay. And my name is Pam Folsom, if you'd like to get a hold of me again. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Pam. <laughs> Any Thank questions? You. I do. Um, yeah, there is a question. <clears throat> Ms. Schmidt, are you working with the Young Woman's Insurance Company to help cover some of your costs? 
You know, the police officer asked me about what the you speech You're talking to the like microphone, from, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, and I know nothing about that. Nobody has contacted me. We have been trying, we've contacted several other lawyers, but we haven't got anywhere. Can you give me some information on that or where can I get it? Well, first of all, I'm not an attorney, but um, if you have the young woman's contact information and, and her parents, then I'm sure that you can reach out to them, or you have, perhaps. You know, I don't even know the name of the girl that hit me. They would not give me that. But there, was, there wasn't a police report filed? There was a police report filed, but the only one I could get is this little silly thing that says there was a scooter accident and, you know, on the date and, and the officer's <clears throat> name. They said that if I wanted the full report with the name and everything, I have to get a lawyer and they have to subpoena the thing. I, I don't know what the girl's name is. I actually, if she hadn't taken pictures of them, I never saw them. Okay, I think that's probably a question our city attorney can mm -hmm. help answer for you. Should I call? But, well, you can, or you can give, uh, I don't know if, is Johanse still here or no? I don't know. Probably upstairs. Okay. <laughs> Does he have your contact information? Here he here comes. You know. Okay, good, <laughs> great. Um, Thank you, uh, Johanse. If, if this woman needed to get more information about a police report where she was a, a victim yeah. of the I think you assailant. could probably do that on, on the back. Yeah, but if you could give him your Help contact her. information and he can advise you on the proper procedure. Thank you very I'll much. I'll do everything I can to help. Yep, yes. okay. wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Thank you. Coming down. You Thank you. Is there anybody else back there that would like to come forward uh, during the open mic? I'll come out. <clears throat> Brian is checking the hallway. Okay. And, Sony, do you have anybody? A big no-hit check from Brian. There's nobody else out there at this time? Sony? I'm going to check here if our individual that registered for webinar. Yep, she is available. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Ella, are you here? I, I am, yes. Uh, okay. Sorry, I just had, okay, I'm sorry. Um, nope, are nope. you ready for me to testify? Okay. We'll start your time at after that point. Thank you. Um, my name is Ella Durham, E L L A D U R H A M. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Lincoln, and I'm currently living in Council Person Bowers District. I'm representing myself, and my views are my own. I just wanted to um, come on to the uh, webinar testimony this evening um, because I um, really appreciate you bringing this option back. Um, I. Uh, I think it's really important to continue to find a way, continue to find ways to meet people where they're at and recognize the barriers that exist to civic participation. Um, and it was, it was really frustrating to see the remote option um, being removed for a while. Um, and this is just such a tricky system to navigate. Um, sometimes I even see you as a council confused as to what the processes are. Um, and uh, so I think to, for the general public, um, it's, it's really intimidating and difficult to engage with. And um, I, I just wanted to say, I would like to see, options like this, um, remote um, uh, comment um, or possibly other options like um, being able to submit testimony that gets placed onto the record um, in a way that you can with the state legislature or even the Lincoln Board of Education. Um, just uh, continuing to find ways to make this uh, process easier to um, engage in. Um, 
I think that's all I have for this evening because I didn't even learn that remote uh, option or remote comment was an option until very recently. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ella. Is there anybody else that'd like to come forward at this time? Okay, Mr. Chair, seeing none, I'd like to say three things. Uh, remember the golden rule, Merry Christmas, and I move adjournment. I'll second, second that. that <laughs> it's you been seconded, it? moved and seconded that we adjourn. Please call the roll. Christensen? Yes. Rabel? Yes. Washington? Yes. Ward? Yes. Shobe? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Motion carried 6-0. We stand adjourned. <clears throat>